This video is about calcium channel blocker overdose and poisoning and as with previous videos I'll put the references I've used in the description below. So what's the role of calcium in muscle contraction? Well in cardiac myocytes calcium enters the cells through L-type calcium channels and also voltage gated calcium channels and that causes the release of more calcium from intracellular stores and that allows excitation contraction coupling to take place. In vascular smooth muscle, an influx of calcium ions is responsible for the maintenance of vascular tone. So if you lose that, you're going to get hypertension through vasodilation. And that's exactly what happens when you take an overdose of something like amlodipine, which is a dihydropyridine that acts peripherally and causes vasodilation. So you get a kind of distributive shock. When you take a more centrally acting non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, you still get that vasodilation from the peripheral effects of calcium channel blockade, but you now also get the more dangerous central effects that are bradycardia and myocardial depression. And this causes a form of cardiogenic shock on top of your distributive shock. So you're going to get more profound hypotension and impaired perfusion. When it comes to calcium channel blocker overdose, the more centrally acting something is, the worse it is, and that's why verapamil overdoses are one of the more dangerous types of overdoses you can take. When you're managing a peripherally acting calcium channel blocker overdose like an amlodipine overdose, the main effect you're going to get is hypotension, and you treat that with fluid. And once you've given a, a couple of boluses of fluid, if that's not enough to restore blood pressure, then it's time to start thinking about vasopressors. Noradrenaline is a, a natural choice because of its action at the alpha-1 receptors. And if that's not enough on its own, you could add in vasopressin. And if that's not enough, then you could consider something more exotic like methylene blue. When we're managing overdoses of the more centrally acting calcium channel blockers like verapamil and diltiazem, it's important to note that even a small overdose of these can be dangerous and that might mean double the normal therapeutic dose or it might mean 10 tablets of someone's modified release preparation and it might be even less than that if someone's elderly or has a lot of comorbidities. In terms of treatment, so we got some of the same treatments. It's important at this point to remember decontamination with activated charcoal that can be given any time up to six hours after ingestion of an immediate release preparation of a calcium channel blocker. Or if it, someone has taken a modified release preparation, you could give charcoal up to 12 hours after ingestion because of that prolonged absorption that you're going to get from the gut. In terms of hypotension, you treat with a bolus of IV fluids again, but once you've restored adequate circulating volume, you don't want to keep pumping someone with fluid because you're not going to fix the underlying problems. Calcium is actually a natural choice when managing calcium channel blocker overdose, and that's because if you blockaded some of the uh, calcium channels, you can overcome that effect by basically increasing the concentration gradient of calcium from outside the cell to inside the cell by giving some calcium. And you might give 0.6 mils per kilo of 10% calcium gluconate, or you could give calcium chloride, you just divide that volume by three, but remember to give it through a uh, central uh, venous catheter or through a, a large peripheral vein at least because it's more caustic. When you think about inotropes, uh, you could use something like isoprenin or dibutamine, but also adrenaline would be a perfectly reasonable choice because it also has some effects at the alpha-1 receptors, which is useful in this context. So you might start with 10 to 20 mics every two or three minutes and then think about setting up an infusion, which you'll probably need if you're giving boluses. It's really important to know about insulin therapy and in particular high dose insulin euglycemic therapy or HIAT in this context and also in the context of beta blocker overdose. And I'm going to do a whole separate video on Hyatt and um, so I'm not going to go too much into it here. I'll also in that same video talk about glucagon, which has less evidence for its use, but is also interesting in terms of the mechanisms. So I'll discuss both those treatments in a separate video. Sodium bicarbonate does have a role to play in calcium channel blocker overdose. There's not a lot of evidence for it, but it, the rationale is basically that you reduce acidosis and acidosis is known to uh, impair the function of inotropes. So if you can get rid of that, then you'll get a better response to your adrenaline. ECMO is also something you should consider because if you've essentially got cardiac failure because of the drug, but you know that the drug is going to be cleared by the body after a, a number of hours or days, then if you can get someone through that by perfusing and oxygenating them with ECMO, then they'll do well in the end. So ECMO should be considered in patients who are uh, severely unwell with a calcium channel blocker overdose. In terms of observation, patients that have taken calcium channel blocker overdoses need at least six hours of observation. And if they've taken a modified release preparation, they should really be kept in for at least 24 hours because of that delayed, prolonged absorption of the drug from the gut in these formulations.